Do you get nightmares? Do you think about this now? How does it come to you now? I had nightmares writing the book. I was really probably not a very nice person to live with for the last two years because I didn't take much time off work to write it, right? I would take a few weeks here um, and then go back to a, an assignment at the CBC and then take a few weeks. So I was trying to straddle like both worlds and it didn't really work out very well because I'm sure if you were to ask, some of, ask Paul or some of my bosses, I was probably not the nicest person to be around. Um, but yeah, I think I had you nightmares. can be forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had nightmares. Um, you know, I, yeah, I had nightmares for a, a long time. I had one the other night because I think talking about it all again brings it all back. Um, but I haven't, you know, after I, I kind of handed in the final draft, I, I felt okay. But in the, it's, I haven't been sleeping very well the last few weeks, which is normal, I think, for... Mm. I'm going to open it up if people have some questions, but I'm just going to ask you um, while we let some people go to the microphones then, what is it that you want us to understand about what happened to you and about that place that you still care so much about even though that happened to you? I hope that when people read the book that they understand that you know the world is not just about good and evil that you know even my captors my kidnappers were human beings as well with their own issues their own struggles their own feelings um it's not that simple to just sort of brand them as being evil they, they weren't they were you know doing what they had to do to survive in that country if they <clears throat> I was just to backtrack a bit I was I did a story at a boys orphanage the year before and a lot of these boys were about some of them were younger but some of them were the same age as my kidnappers and the director of the orphanage told me you know if they weren't here they'd be recruited by the Taliban right <coughs> So life, it, life is a struggle there. And I just kind of hope that, you know, what people will take away after they read the book is get a, a sort of an understanding of how much work needs to be done in that country and, and why, you know, why Canada is still there. You know, I can't be the only one listening to you who marvels at how how extraordinarily kind you are to those who did all of that to you, how little bitterness you have. And, and I, you know, I, I think um, maybe there's a lesson in that too. It's, um, it's so interesting to hear you talk. I couldn't still be angry because that doesn't, doesn't do me any good to carry that around, right? Like, it's like what I said, uh, you know, before, forgiveness is easy. Because, because it's letting go. It's, you, you're not trapping yourself in, in that anger. So why not just forgive? It's way better, it's way easier than carrying it around when the people who did this to me are, you know, nowhere to be found. If everybody thought like you, Melissa Fung, there wouldn't be wars to cover now, would there? <laughs> Um, I'm going to start there. Keep, if I can ask you to keep your, your comments and questions brief so that we can get a few in because then Melissa will be signing books as well. But go ahead. Um, I, you know, I think grace-filled is uh, the word that I would use for, uh, and you're, I'm not sure how lapsed your Catholicism is or uh, at least uh, something has uh, stuck very uh, strongly to you. But I am interested in your spiritual life and I saw your interview with Isabel Betancourt and you both were talking about the rosary and how that had helped you both get through. And so I've just been really curious about since, you know, it has, uh, and has maybe you haven't had changed? time. Is that what Not so much changed. Well, maybe changed. I'm just curious about uh, where your spiritual journey is, has gone since. 
It's a good question, and I don't, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for you because for the longest time I couldn't pray the rosary after I got back because it would bring me back too much. And I was talking about this, you know, with a friend of mine who said, well, maybe you just, you don't pray that way anymore. Maybe, you know, you reciting prayers isn't how you relate to, to your faith anymore. So now I just kind of, I, I talk in my head. Um, I, you know, I still try to go to Mass because my mom would not be happy if I became totally lapsed, but I, I'm... I'm a bit lapsed, still. <laughs> Probably as lapsed as I was before. I don't know. It's not a good answer. I'm sorry. I can't. I don't have a better one. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I thought he was going to speak. That's okay. Um, Melissa, I, my name's Catherine. I work at CBC. And I'm a graphic designer, and I was doing the News World Day Shift when this happened to you. And before this, I really only thought of you as this very small person who never stood close enough for the camera to be for me to get a good headshot of you. <laughs> um, and. Um, and I guess everybody There's a good here, reason for that. I, I, I don't know if everybody here knows that it was so top secret that only very key people at work knew that this was happening. And on the day that they told us that it had happened and that you were okay, uh, I just don't know if you know how much it meant to everybody, even people you'd never spoken to in person at CBC, how much it meant to us that you were okay. And I think it's really... Um, it's really colored so much how I feel about all the people that I have to make pictures of all the time. How grateful I am to them for everything. I got so many emails from other CBC all over the country. One was probably, from me. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? CBC shut down my account, right? Oh. Like they, <laughs> they did, well, just in case, right? In case, like for security reasons. They I took you off the website too. It was a big secret and every news organization in the world agreed not to report it. Essentially everyone. There were a few reports at the very beginning. It was a tactic to keep her out of the news, and it happened again. Uh, New York Times reporter, nobody knew when he was taken either. It was, it's, it's now a tactic of, I don't know what you think about that a tactic. It um, yeah. seemed to help, I don't. I don't, I don't know, and, I, and David Rode and I have talked about it. Um, you know, it's so controversial, but it, it seemed to work in my case, but maybe, Maybe if I had been in the news, you know, I would, there would have been more political pressure early, earlier on. I, I don't know, right? All I can say is I'm glad that it worked out for me. Yeah, I just wanted you to know that it's a big organization, but it's also very personal, and we really... No, thank you. because we, I'm so happy. I eventually did get all of those emails and, and, and didn't get to return them all because I think there were... I think every CBC employee <laughs> wrote me a note. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I have a small comment to make, uh, which I don't mean by, uh, by making this comment to uh, dismiss your suffering at all, uh, but just to put it in context, because I feel that it's my duty when I hear the horrible story, story of your kidnapping to remember and remind others of the horrible suffering of thousands of others who were also imprisoned and illegally kidnapped in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo by the hands of the occupation forces. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't say this at all to dismiss your uh, suffering. No, but, yeah. actually, feel free to dismiss my suffering because this is my point, in the, which is the point that I make in the book, is that, you know, I'm, I, I don't like being here in the center of all this. I, I'm not the story, right? I, it's those people, it's the, all the women who are still being abused mm -hmm. and assaulted every day in Afghanistan and Pakistan, yeah, who, if they cry rape, they get thrown in jail. Right? So that's, you know, I, that's the other thing that comes out in the book, too, is that I try to tell some of these stories and to, to take, to sort of put me in context, right? I'm not, I'm one person. This thing that happened to me it was horrible, but 
there are horrible things happening to women and children in Afghanistan every day. And yeah, so exactly. hopefully, you know, by, by talking about what happened to me, it will raise some awareness of all the work that still needs to be done. Yeah, that's exactly my point, is to put it in context, context of a bigger suffering, because as we have seen in the last 10 years, the occupation and its puppet regimes have only created new problems or escalated existing problems to the extent that in their reaction to the criminal act of kidnapping you, they cr c committed a criminal act by kidnapping an Afghani family to, to release you. So I think it's also important to view this angle of, to understand the roots of, of the problem which results in such sufferings as yours and many others. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Carol. Um, get, I'll get you to come a little closer to the microphone, please. Oh, okay. My name is Carol. Um, you're an incredibly beautiful young woman. Um, I, I got the sense that when you were being interviewed by Marie that you, I, I just didn't get a sense that you were suffering very much. That's not to suggest that you weren't suffering. Um, I think that you're obviously a very brave young woman. But being thrown in that hole, I didn't get a sense from the interview of what was going through your head. You know, I, I still don't know whether there was uh, something for you to see outside or whether it was just the two pipes coming in. I, I, I'd, I'd like to just kind of ask you what you felt inside. I mean, I, I don't know that you were very afraid because it didn't come through to me. I couldn't be afraid. Like, uh -huh. I, I couldn't be afraid. It, it was a hole. There was nothing I couldn't see outside. It was a hole. Not at all. Okay. No, not, not, not at all. It was <clears throat> dark. It was dark. I couldn't see outside. But I couldn't... I've never been afraid of the dark, yeah. really. So, it, you know, that wasn't an issue. But mm. I couldn't be afraid because that wouldn't help me. Right, like I sort of had to sort of maintain my maintain my sanity, yeah. you know. Which is why some people think that I do. In the first interview that we did in Dubai, think that I was very detached, right? And and maybe I have to be to sort of protect myself a little bit. I understand that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I don't have you know in terms of what I was feeling, thinking at the time. I I really was trying not to feel that much, okay. probably. Okay. And that's probably what comes across. Can, can you tell me, and this might sound like a foolish question, I know there's many, many reasons people are kidnapped in those countries. Um, what was, do, you, do you know any specific reason why you were particularly taken? No, it, I was in the right place at the at wrong the right time. At the wrong time, yeah. They, were, they, they told me that they were looking for somebody, mm -hmm. um, anybody, I just, happened to be there. Yeah. And in your case, I gather from what I've heard today, and I'm going to have to read the book now, but um, you were not... And this physically. is going to be your last question because there are people okay. behind you too. There, you were not... Um, they, they were re relatively gentle with you. It, is, am I correct in saying that? <laughs> when I say that, I realize I mean, you were thrown in a hole. No, I, that, I, that's not what I mean. What I mean is they didn't beat you up. That's what I'm asking you. Were you physically abused? Not raped. I'm not asking that question. That's okay, not my business. Okay, I'm sorry. Do you, do you want to? No, I mean, I, was, I, I did say I was assaulted at knife point. No, okay, the... okay, yeah, you were. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate thank you, you answering my questions. Thanks. Go ahead. I've got a fun question. I, Melissa, thank you so much for so courageously uh, sharing your story with us. I've read that you're a passionate Canucks fan, and uh, <laughs> it, with the playoffs uh, up, upon us and we're all enjoying them, I'd like you, if you possible, to uh, make a prediction on how far the Canucks will go. Oh, no! And, and tell us who your favorite Canucks players are. Thank you. <laughs> now, there's a question I don't have a problem answering. I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll make it to the final. Um, a piece of trivia that might help Canuck fans is that it's been Montreal hosted the Olympics. The next year, the Canadians won the cup. In 88, Calgary hosted the Olympics. 89, they won the cup. 2010, Vancouver hosts the Olympics. <laughs> Fingers crossed. 
You should know there's a, a there's a game. When is it next Saturday? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Melissa has re doesn't want to do a, an event about her book because she knows that she has to be at the game. <laughs> it's in Vancouver too, you know, and I, I'd rather be at the game. Final question, go ahead. Hi, um, it's hard to follow that question right there. Um, my name is Ruane Remy, and I'm a journalism student at Ryerson. Since I'm, since I'm last, I was gonna ask you two questions. Um, oh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> what advice would you give to a young female correspondent? Oh man, I, you, you, no, you I don't. ask you for that advice all the time. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Um, just be curious. Know why you want to be a journalist. Know what stories you want to tell. Um, and stick by them. Sometimes, I, I know when to pick your battles because it's not always worth it to put up a fight when your editor asks you to do a story about the weather. Um, but just know, know why. Always never forget why you want to be a journalist, right? Why do you want to be a journalist? Can I ask you? Because I like telling people's stories. Never forget that. And you'll tell good stories. Okay. Um, what okay, did... one more question, because that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does it take to be a foreign correspondent? Like, what kind of personality traits? I don't know. You should ask Anna Maria, because I'm not a foreign correspondent. <laughs> I really am not. I've had a few foreign assignments, but I, I'll... Over to you. Joe Schlesinger used to say, a cast iron stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Thank wait, you. I, I, um, wait, I want to say the, the, the foundation. What's that? About foundation, yeah. I want to, um, before, before we uh, get back to the back signing, um, Melissa is donating the royalties for this book to... My portion of the royalties. To, uh, to a foundation. Talk to us just a bit about the foundation. The foundation is, um, I always wanted something good to come out of everything that happened and this is the best way I could do it was to donate my portion of the royalties to um, an, it's called the Ayenda Foundation and they it's a it's run by an Afghan woman who um, goes back and forth between the United States and Afghanistan now but they built a school in the province of Bamiyan um, it's, you know, they're busing kids to school from villages and they now want to build a computer lab to teach kids um, how to give them computer and internet skills and turn the school in the afternoons into a women's center so that women can have a chance to learn the computer and internet skills that will help them connect to the outside world. So, you know, it's, that's, it's important to me um, to that something good come out of this because um, there hasn't been a lot. <laughs> it hasn't been that great. Um, but if if I can buy a few computers, um, help them set up that lab, it'll make me really happy to have gone through this. So please buy a book. That Allende. Thank you.